Welcome to the lecture on Frank Jackson's What Mary Didn't Know. I'm Andrew Chapman, and in this lecture, we'll be discussing the knowledge argument against physicalism. The knowledge argument is one of the most famous arguments in metaphysics and the philosophy of mind against the position known as physicalism. And it's one of the arguments that's still talked about today in the philosophy of mind and metaphysics. And a whole cottage industry has developed in uh, responding to this argument, in trying to figure out different formulations of the argument, and in seeing what the argument actually proves. The argument itself is also run by one of the most famous thought experiments in contemporary philosophy. So once you know this thought experiment and the argument that attaches to it, you'll know something that all contemporary professional philosophers are conversant in. Says Jackson, Mary is confined to a black and white room, is educated through black and white books and through lectures relayed on black and white television. In this way, she learns everything there is to know about the physical nature of the world. She knows all the physical facts about us and our environment in a wide sense of physical, which includes everything in complete physics, chemistry, and neurophysiology, and all there is to know about the causal and relational facts consequent upon this, including, of course, functional roles. It seems, however, that Mary does not yet know all there is to know. In setting up the thought experiment for us, Jackson is giving us this woman, Mary, and uh, we're also to assume that Mary is brilliant. She's a color scientist of some sort. She understands everything there is to know about color. And what has gone on here, Jackson's showing us, is that even if Mary knows all of the physical facts there are to know, there are yet some things that she doesn't know. And if that's the case, there might be some implications for the thesis of physicalism. This is Frank Jackson. Jackson was born in 1943 and has held a number of different academic positions around the world during his time as a philosopher. He is currently um, on the faculty at the Australian National University. Jackson has had a wide influence in contemporary academic philosophy in the Anglophone world. One of the philosophers who he has been most influential with respect to is the philosopher of mind David Chalmers. A number of Chalmers' arguments and the positions that Chalmers has worked out from those arguments show a direct relation to the work that Frank Jackson has done. So not only has Jackson been influential in his own right, but he's influenced other people who themselves have been very influential. Jackson is also one of a, uh, an unfortunately very small group of philosophers who have become famous for putting forward specific sorts of arguments and then have changed their mind about the very arguments that they put forth. Sometimes in the academic world, not only the philosophical world, but also the philosophical world, um, it's seen, unfortunately, as some sort of uh, weakness, maybe, or intellectual um, infirmity of some sort to put forward arguments and become famous for putting forward arguments for particular positions and then to go back on those arguments to say, oh no, I didn't recognize something about what I'd said or what I said actually shows something that I didn't realize. And in uh, the academic world, that's understandable since people become famous, they make their careers by um, becoming attached to particular positions or arguments, but it is unfortunate given that if somebody is supposed to always be the person who puts forward this specific sort of argument or defends this specific position, then that's incentive for them never to go back and examine what they've done. And it's incentive for other philosophers not to care so much about the truth, but to care about defending particular doctrinal positions. And Jackson, as I've said, 
uh, is not one of those sorts of philosophers. So the argument that you'll see uh, that we're talking about here, the knowledge argument, Jackson has actually in recent years decided that it shows something other than what he thought it showed, and we'll talk just a little bit about that at the end of the lecture. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of the argument, though, let's look at an overview of what Jackson's doing, since it's at once very simple, but also very complicated. Now, by calling this an overview of Jackson's argument, rather than uh, a strict formalization of his argument, what I mean to imply is that while I will be laying out this overview in a stepwise fashion, there's some detail that's missing here, and the argument as it stands isn't formally um, stipulated, formally laid out in the way that you would lay out an argument if you were trying to be maximally careful. So I will lay out the argument in a maximally careful way in a second. And just want to give you first a picture, from, like a bird's eye picture of what the argument looks like. Jackson's thesis is that the view known as physicalism is false, and that means that not all actual things are physical things. We'll look more in depth momentarily at this view known as physicalism. The argument for the claim that physicalism is false looks like this. Well, if physicalism were true, then all things would have to be physical things. And if all things are physical things, then that means that there are no facts about non-physical things. There can only be facts about the things that exist. And all of the things that exist are physical things. If physicalism is true, therefore all the facts would be about physical things. And if there are no facts about non-physical things, then if you know all of the facts, then you know all of the physical facts. There aren't any further facts to be known out there other than the physical facts. So physical facts and facts are one and the same thing. However, says Jackson, there is knowledge over and above that of the physical facts. Once you know all the physical facts, there are still things to know. And therefore, there are facts about non-physical things, and if that's the case, then physicalism is false. Now, you might notice here that there's quite a bit of work to do in explaining and defending these different steps of the, arguments, uh, of the argument, and that's what we'll be doing now. Now, Jackson's argument, as you no doubt notice, has implications for what we mean by the mind, since uh, generally when people are talking about physicalism, they're talking about implications for what minds are. But even more broadly, Jackson's argument has implications for what's known as metaphysics. So briefly, before we get into the specifics of the argument, we should look at what philosophy of mind is and what metaphysics is. So what is the philosophy of mind? Philosophers of mind are concerned with what minds are what minds can do, and how minds are able to do the things that they're able to do. Some of the questions, although not all of the questions, that are asked by philosophers of mind are, what is the nature of mind? That is, what's the essence of a mind? What kind of substance is the mind? Is it merely physical? Is it partially non-physical? Is it all non-physical? This is one of the questions that Jackson's argument has implications for. What is the relation between minds and bodies? What are the different sorts of mental states? This is another one of the questions that Jackson's argument has implications for. What are the contents of mental states? What is the relation between the mind and the world? And finally, what is the nature of consciousness? This is finally another one of the questions that Jackson's argument has implications for. That's a very brief overview of the subdiscipline of philosophy known as the philosophy of mind. Now let's look at a very brief overview of the subdiscipline of philosophy known as metaphysics. Metaphysics is sometimes confused with what goes on in New Age practices or the sorts of books you can read in New Age bookstores. 
That is one way to use the term metaphysics. However, when philosophers are concerned with metaphysics, they're concerned with a foundational discipline in philosophy that stretches back at least as far as Aristotle, if not much further, and has very little to do with what goes on in New Age practices or New Age bookstores. So don't confuse what philosophers are up to when they're doing metaphysics with what's going on with those sorts of practitioners, those sorts of investigative disciplines. Metaphysicians, sometimes called metaphysicists, are concerned with the ultimate nature of reality, including what exists, how it functions, in what way it exists, and why it exists. Some, but not all, of the questions asked by metaphysicians are, what is the nature of being? That's an even more foundational, fundamental question than what's going on with different things that exist, but what does it mean to exist? What's the nature of this thing that existing things do called being? And that's generally capitalized by philosophers to distinguish it from individual beings. Is there a fundamental level of reality? And is there a fundamental nature of reality? So notice that these two questions are related to each other, but nonetheless distinct. What are the relations between the things that exist? There are certainly many different relations that things can stand in with respect to one another. What are those sorts of relations? What are time and space, and how are they related to the objects that exist? While physicists might talk about the relations between time and space, or time and space and energy, or time and space and energy and matter and momentum, and position, Philosophers, metaphysicians, are concerned with something more foundational than that. What is this thing that we call time? What is this thing that we call space? And finally, what's the nature of specifically human being? Humans exist. We exist in similar ways to how things like trees and tables and rocks exist, but we seem to be different in many ways. One of the ways that we seem to be different is that we're conscious, we can make choices, and oftentimes it seems as though our actions or our choices have some degree of freedom to them. So these are fundamental questions that are asked about the nature of the specifically human sort of being. As I've said, Jackson's argument and his thesis has implications both for metaphysics and for the philosophy of mind. And if you keep that in mind throughout the rest of the lecture, you'll see those specific implications. Jackson is primarily concerned with a thesis known as physicalism, so it's important for us to get clear on what physicalism is. As we've already seen, physicalism is the thesis that all the stuff that exists is physical. But we should broaden what we think about when we talk about stuff to features of the world. There are no features in the world at all, including all of the objects, all of the relations, all of the laws. There are none of those things that aren't physical, according to physicalism. Now, physicalism is not the thesis that most of the stuff, most of the features in the actual world are physical. Most people think that most of the stuff that exists in the world is physical, or at least most of the stuff that we interact with is physical. But physicalism is the further claim that not most of the stuff, but all of the stuff is physical. It's important to recognize that physicalism is not the same as the thesis of naturalism. Oftentimes, natural scientists especially will confuse the theses of physicalism and naturalism. Now, it might be the case that the natural world just is the physical world, but at least conceptually, these are separate questions. There might be room in the natural world for non-physical phenomena. So, to talk about the natural world is standardly taken to be talking about the world in which we exist, the non-supernatural world. If physicalism is true, then the natural world is physical since all that exists is physical. And then what does it mean for something to be physical? We've been using this term as if we know what it means. Well, this is a very tough question, and it's a question that physicalists need to answer so that we know what we're talking about. And just very broadly, 
physical is sometimes cashed out in terms of what the physicists study. So go up to some physicists and say, tell me what you research, the sorts of things that you investigate, and whatever they tell you, that's what the physical stuff is. And you might worry about some circularity here. Physicists study the physical, and the physical is what the physicists study. So even further, sometimes people will cash out physical in terms of causal efficacy. So if something can be related to other things in terms of causes and effects, then it's a physical thing. Now, um, I should note that that definition, as well as the definition where physical is what the physicists study, um, those are, are not uncontroversial. They're just sort of standard first step definitions. Now, physicalism is true there are some implications for epistemology, specifically for what knowledge is. If physicalism is true, as you know, then all the things are physical. Now, knowledge is factive. What philosophers mean by that is that if you know something, then what you know is true. You can't know false things. You can think you know false things and be wrong. But insofar as you succeed in knowing something, then you know something true. Now, if you know everything about something, then you know all of the true things about that thing. There can't be true things that you don't know if you know all of the true things about that thing. But if physicalism is true, then complete physical knowledge knowledge of all the physical stuff, is the exact same thing as complete knowledge simplicator. Simplicator here just means without qualification. So physical knowledge is knowledge simplicator, since, according to physicalism, there isn't anything over and above the physical, so there is no knowledge to be had over and above physical knowledge. And another way to put this is that were there something to have knowledge of over and above the physical, then there would be something over and above the physical. And this is exactly what physicalism denies. Insofar as all the things are physical, all the knowledge there is to be had is physical. Insofar as you have all the physical knowledge, you have all of the knowledge. Here's the heart of what Jackson is doing. This has come to be known as the knowledge argument in philosophy. So if you reference the knowledge argument to a philosopher, this is what they'll think you're talking about. Premise one of the knowledge argument. If physicalism is true, then all things are physical. This just follows from the definition of physicalism. This is just what it means for physicalism to be true. Premise two. If all things are physical, then for any phenomenon, there's no possible knowledge of that phenomenon over and above complete physical knowledge of that phenomenon. That follows from what we just saw. If all the stuff is physical, then all the truths are about physical things, and all the knowledge is about all the truths, and all the truths are physical things, so all the knowledge is of physical things, meaning that all the physical knowledge exhausts all of the possible knowledge. But it's possible, says Jackson, for some person to have complete physical knowledge of some phenomenon and yet to lack qualitative or experiential knowledge of that phenomenon. Now why think this? Well, remember back to Mary. Mary is in a black and white room. She learns everything about the physical experience of color, but nonetheless, when she's released from the black and white room, for example, sees a tomato, she learns something. What she learns is what it's like to experience redness. So Jackson's showing that by his hypothesis, somebody could learn all the physical facts about something then experience that thing, and nonetheless learn something. Thus, from 1, 2, and 3, not all things are physical. 
and therefore, given that the definition of physicalism is that all things are physical, physicalism is false. It's easy when you first encounter this argument to think that Jackson is trying to do something a little bit sinister, or pull a fast one over on you, but the argument is very simple. Stipulate that Mary has all the physical knowledge. Now, does it seem plausible that when Mary, for the first time, experiences redness, that she learns something? Yes, of course it does. Well, if she can have all the physical knowledge, but nonetheless learn something, then there was something that she didn't know. And if she had all the physical knowledge, but there was still something she didn't know, then some of the knowledge is about non-physical stuff, and the only knowledge that's possible is knowledge of the truth. And if there's non-physical knowledge, then that means it's true that there are some non-physical facts about the world and physicalism is false. So what does this tell us if physicalism is false? Now, we haven't yet examined the argument fully, but if Jackson's right and physicalism is false, what should we conclude? Well, if physicalism is false, we know that not all things are physical, but there are, very, there are many different versions of non-physicalism, and some people um, try to get out of Jackson's argument by thinking that there's only one possible version of non-physicalism, and it's something very strange, and therefore we shouldn't buy Jackson's argument, even if we don't know what's gone wrong with it. But while there are some strange versions of non-physicalism, not all of the versions of non-physicalism are strange. And so uh, we shouldn't jump right to the strangest alternative in order to try to refute Jackson's argument. Here are a few versions of non-physicalism, going from what I think is perhaps uh, the strangest to what I think is maybe the least strange. The first is anti-physicalism. There are a few different versions of anti-physicalism, but anti-physicalism says there's nothing that's physical. The Enlightenment philosopher George Berkeley thought that there was no such thing as matter, that all there were were ideas and minds, and that those ideas were in those minds, and the minds themselves were non-physical. So his form of philosophy was a version of anti-physicalism, and most people haven't found that very plausible. Another version of non-physicalism is substance dualism. Substance dualism claims there are two types of stuff, two types of substance in the world. There's physical stuff, and there's non-physical stuff. And the physical stuff is generally thought to interact with the non-physical stuff, although there are some versions of substance dualism where they don't interact with each other. They just appear to interact. Many people have found substance dualism to be implausible, positing some extra substance in order to make sense of what's gone on in these sorts of arguments seems to be overkill to a lot of people. It's even further unclear how it's supposed to be the case that the physical and the non-physical are supposed to interact with each other. Property dualism is another version of non-physicalism. David Chalmers, who we've noted um, was influenced by Frank Jackson's work, is a property dualist. He thinks that while at root all the substances that are out there are physical, substances can have both physical and non-physical properties to them. And the physical properties um, are what makes sense of, for example, the hardness of an object, but the non-physical properties can make sense of, for example, the experiential properties that consciousness has. And finally, there's liberal naturalism. Liberal naturalism uh, is the view that there aren't two different sorts of substances or properties. There are two different sorts of facts. Now, in, in one way, it makes sense to call liberal naturalism a sort of dualism, although it's not substance or property dualism. So uh, don't go the route of people who misunderstand liberal naturalism and think that it's claiming that there are two different sorts of stuff. It's that there are two different sorts of facts, and the physical facts make, sort of, make sense of the merely physical stuff, and um, those are related to 
non-physical facts that can explain to us things like consciousness or normativity or ethics. Now, there have been a number of what I'll call abortive replies to Jackson, and these aren't just bad replies or failed replies. I'm calling them abortive because they're not even replies to Jackson. They misunderstand what Jackson's done and then reply to some other argument that Jackson hasn't even given. So they're dead on arrival. These arguments have looked like this. Mary does learn something when she exits the black and white room. Something about sensations and their properties. That's the claim made by the philosopher Paul Churchland. Or Mary has learned some new ability, so she hasn't gained uh, knowledge of particular facts. She's gained an ability, like an ability to ride a bike. She's gained the ability to experience redness or whatever. However, this knowledge itself is completely physical in nature, say Churchland or Lewis. And hence, the fact that Mary learns something is entirely consistent with physicalism. So the thought is, Mary does know a whole bunch of stuff in the black and white room, and when she leaves the black and white room and learns something, what she learns is itself physical. So Mary hasn't learned anything non-physical, and hence, physicalism isn't challenged. Now, when we're looking at an argument, we should note that there are two and only two ways to challenge the conclusion of an argument. So if somebody gives you an argument and you don't like the conclusion, there are only two different things that you can do to rationally challenge that conclusion. One of the things that you can do is to claim that the conclusion doesn't follow logically from the premises. That is, you can show that there's something structurally wrong with the argument. This would be, as philosophers would say, to show that the argument is not valid, that the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. The only other thing you can do is to show that at least one of the premises is false. So if you've got a valid argument, but one of the premises is false, there's no good reason to accept the conclusion. So let's look back at the knowledge argument. According to the knowledge argument, physicalism is false because of something that's learned by Mary when she steps out of the room, even though she already has all of the physical knowledge. Now, if we look at this argument, premises 1, 2, 3, and 4, and their conclusion 5, we can notice that the argument is valid. There's no way for the premises to all be true and the conclusion to be false. In fact, I've set it up that way to give the argument the fairest hearing. So if somebody doesn't like this particular formulation of the knowledge argument, they can't say that the problem with the argument is that it's invalid. The argument is valid, so if there's something wrong with this argument, it needs to be with the truth of one of the premises. Now let's look back at what's supposed to support that third premise, the Mary thought experiment. So notice that uh, Jackson here is claiming that it's possible to have all physical knowledge, but still lack some knowledge, the knowledge of what it's like to experience something. So when we look back at this thought experiment, we can see what Jackson's saying. He's saying that Mary has all of the physical knowledge, but it still seems like there's something that Mary doesn't know. Now, Chalmer, excuse me, uh, Lewis and Churchland accept that it does seem, given the way that this thought experiment is set up, that there's something that Mary doesn't know. However, what they disagree with is that Mary learns everything there is to know about the physical nature of the world when she's in the black and white room. What they're saying is she learns a whole bunch of physical stuff, but there's still more physical stuff to learn. Now, this is not an acceptable reply because it doesn't challenge either the validity of the argument or the truth of any of the premises. It challenges the thought experiment as Jackson has set it up. So imagine, by analogy, that I say, for the sake of argument, 
let's say that I buy a really big dog, and the dog eats so and so much food every day. How am I going to deal with this specific problem? And you respond by saying, well, what if you didn't buy a big dog? I would rightly reply, no, no, no. You've misunderstood what's going on here. I'm saying, for the sake of argument, let's just say that I do buy a big dog. I want to know how to deal with the problem that might arise if I do that. If you say you didn't buy a big dog, you're misunderstanding what's going on here. The way that Jackson has set up the argument, he's saying, for the sake of argument, let's say that Mary learns all of the physical facts. To respond with, no, she doesn't, is to misunderstand what's happened here. And so what Lewis and Churchland have done is not responded to what Jackson has set up. They've responded to their own argument that doesn't have anything to do with what's going on here. Now, that's a subtle point, but it's important both in the history of this argument and in understanding how to respond to arguments. If somebody asks you to consider something for the sake of argument, if you think that it's possible to consider that thing for the sake of argument, you can't then go and throw it out. So let's look at some other possible replies that people could give to what Jackson has said here, his argument against physicalism. And I say other possible replies because I think that a completely acceptable possible reply is just to accept what Jackson has done. In fact, I think some version of liberal naturalism is probably true, and that arguments like Jackson's lend support to the truth of liberal naturalism. But if you don't like accepting what Jackson has apparently proven here, here are some things that uh, you could do in reply. The first is to say that when Mary learns all the physical facts, she does learn what it's like to experience redness, even though she's never seen something red. Now, if that's what you accept, then you would have to say that when Mary steps out of the black and white room and experiences, sees a red tomato, she doesn't learn anything at all. She already knows what it's like to experience redness, even though she's never seen something red. Now, most philosophers have found that to be um, uh, not very plausible, but it is the sort of thing that you could say, learning all the physical facts does teach her what it's like to experience something. Another way that you could go is to say that it's not possible for Mary to learn all of the physical facts from within her black and white room. Now, if it's not possible for her to learn all of the physical facts, then you might say that when she steps out of the black and white room, she does, in fact, learn some new thing, but what she learns is physical. Notice how this is similar to the way that Lewis and Churchland have tried to respond. But Lewis and Churchland haven't said that it's not possible for Mary to learn all of the physical facts. They at once say she learns all the physical facts and then say, and then she learns some more physical facts. So they seem to have misunderstood the force of the argument. You could say, look, Jackson, the way that you set up the argument is impossible. I can't accept the way that you set up the argument because you're saying it's possible for Mary to learn all of the physical facts, and no, it isn't. An even further way that you might respond to Jackson is to say it's false that if all things are physical, then for any phenomenon, there's no possible knowledge of that phenomenon over and above complete physical knowledge of that phenomenon. So this is driving a wedge between everything being physical and all knowledge being knowledge of physical things. Now, you'd have to create a kind of complicated epistemological story to make sense of why knowledge goes over and above the sorts of things you know about, but this is a possible move as well, to say that knowledge of things is not directly related to all the things that exist. In this lecture, we've taken a look at Frank Jackson's very famous and influential knowledge argument against physicalism, and we've looked at the particular, also very famous, thought experiment that Jackson gives in favor of his claim that even if you have all of the physical knowledge, you don't yet have all of the knowledge there is to have. 
And this is a, a very brilliant thing that Jackson does. He shows us that our intuitions about knowledge and our intuitions about what exists, uh, what exists are oftentimes at odds with each other. And so we need to bring these intuitions in line with each other. And Jackson thinks that the easiest way to do this is to throw out the claim that all the things that exist are physical. Now, as I noted at the beginning of the lecture, Jackson has since come back and um, responded to his own argument and claimed that in the original formulation of the argument, he got something wrong. And what Jackson thinks he's gotten wrong is that learning in the way that Mary does might not teach her all of the relevant physical facts, that there might be ways that Mary needs to learn about the physical facts that aren't possible from within her black and white room. And the solution is similar to um, a, a conglomeration of some of the solutions that we have just looked at, some of the replies to, um, to Jackson's own argument. Um, but getting into Jackson's response is above and beyond what we'll be doing here in this lecture. So it's important when you consider metaphysical positions to also consider our experience of the world and whether the metaphysical positions are in line with what we experience. And of course it is always possible to go skeptical and to say, well, why should we think that our experience has anything to do with what exists? But you might worry that you've thrown the metaphysical baby out with the epistemological bathwater there. If it's possible for us to know anything about the world at all, then we should make sure that our metaphysical conclusions are in line with what it's possible for us to know. And Jackson has given us a very strong argument in favor of the claim that we can know more than just the physical, and hence, the world itself isn't entirely physical. Thank you.